there, I'm Dr. Chris Lavallo, and I'm an associate professor of chemistry and physics here at Mount Royal University. Today I'm going to be talking to you about a collaborative water project that your school has done with our analytical chemistry students. The reason we chose your school is because you're learning about freshwater and saltwater systems in your science class. Your part of the project was to collect water samples, like this one here, and then our part of the project was to have our analytical chemistry students analyze and test it for various types of ions. To help you understand what we did, we're going to show you the tools and the machines that we use to analyze your water samples. This is a similar water sample to those you took at your school. There are two basic types of water samples, flowing and static. A flowing water sample is from a source that you probably guessed it, is flowing, whereas a static water sample is one from water that's been not moving for a period of time. For example, in the pipes behind the water fountains at your school. To get a flowing water sample, what we asked you to do was to run the water fountains for at least 30 seconds before you took your water sample. We prefer to use flowing samples because they are a better representation of what you would normally drink at your school. In the next few segments, we're going to look at the instruments that the chemistry students use to analyze your samples, how they did it, and what those results show. Pause the video to discuss the following. Now that we understand the difference between flowing and static water, let's talk about how we analyze the water to find out what's in it. We're gonna start with the atomic absorption method, which is a method where we take the water sample and burn it in a very hot flame to analyze the ions that are in it. Here is Mount Royal's atomic absorption spectrometer. We're currently running a calcium sample right now. Let's take a closer look. The water sample containing calcium begins its journey in the liquid form. It is sucked into the machine through this capillary tube, which looks like a straw. The sample then moves through the nebulizer and it is converted into a mist, like that that comes out of a puffer for asthma. The mist then moves into a mixing chamber where it comes into contact with the fuel, in this case acetylene gas, and compressed air, which contains oxygen. At this point, 90% of the sample will just end up in the waste bucket, and only 10% will be swept into the burner. Combustion of the sample begins when the mixture passes over the burner and is lit on fire by the flame, putting the calcium in the vapor phase. The sample is burned at a whopping 23 to 2400 degrees Celsius, the same temperature used to weld metal. As a comparison, lava flows run at between 700 to 1200 degrees Celsius, so our water samples are being burned at twice the heat of a lava flow. The calcium vapor absorbs light from a lamp such as this one. The light sources in this machine are a series of hollow cathode ray tube lamps. Cathode ray tube lamps are vacuum tubes, just like an incandescent light bulb, like the kind Thomas Edison used on his experiments with electricity. The lamps inside this machine, there's one for each individual element in here. Each one glows a separate color to analyze for a specific element. Here's a closer look at what a cathode ray tube lamp looks like. Here's one here for a calcium lamp. This is filled not with air, but with neon gas, and in the center you see a bit of calcium metal. When electrical current is passed through the lamp, energy from the electrical current passes into the neon atoms. The neon atoms get very excited and move quickly around the lamp. Eventually, the excited neon atoms will collide with the calcium in the middle of the ball. The neon atoms then transfer their energy into the calcium and the calcium gets excited. But the calcium atom is boring and does not wish to be in an excited state. They like to be stable. So how will it release all of that extra energy? They will emit light. The light that the calcium emits passes over the flame. As the light passes over the flame, some of it is absorbed by the calcium atoms in the vapor. Analysis begins when the light hits the detector on the opposite end from the lamp. The detector measures how much light was absorbed by the calcium atoms in the water sample. The less light reaching the detector means a higher concentration of calcium in the sample. And then the machine converts the light to a concentration of calcium, which we can see in the screen over here. Now we can switch to a different sample containing lithium so that we can see how the color changes depending on the element we are studying.
The reason for the variation in colors is that each element absorbs different wavelengths of light. Have you ever noticed that there are a few different colors of fireworks? That's because when the gunpowder inside the firework explodes, the elements inside the firework produce different colors. For example, sodium is gold, barium is green, copper is blue, strontium is red, and titanium is silver. So the next time you watch a fireworks performance, think of all the chemistry that went on behind the scenes. Now that we have discussed atomic absorption, let's move on to the second method that we use to analyze your water samples, ion chromatography. Ion chromatography is the process of separating ions based on their properties, such as size or charge. The reason we use ion chromatography in addition to atomic absorption is because not all of the ions we're studying today are colored, so we cannot use atomic absorption with them. So here is the ion chromatography machine. Over here are where the samples are. Inside here is the column that separates the ions itself, and in there is the detector that detects the ions after they go through the column. Let's take a closer look. The sample is injected into the column, which is where the separation of the sample components occurs. The ions are separated based on their size. Larger ions get stuck in the column and take longer to find their way through to the detector. The detector measures the conductivity of the solution running through it. Pure water does not conduct electricity, so the conductivity is very low, near zero. When an ion passes through the detector, the conductivity increases and we'll see a peak in our results. All right, we're all done. So let's see what the results tell us. So along here is our chromatograph. Each peak along here represents a different ion. Depending on the sample, those could be fluoride, chloride, nitrate, or sulfate. The size of the peak indicates how much of the ion is present in our sample. So along here, we have a chloride peak and a nitrate peak. You can see that the nitrate peak is much larger. That indicates that there's more nitrate in the sample than there is chloride. In the next segment, we'll look at what this means for the results we got for your school. Pause the video to discuss the following. Let's analyze the results of both of our tests. We'll be taking your results and comparing them to the City of Calgary Water Treatment Plant Annual Report. Both sets of your results were entered by MRU chemistry students into this, ArcGIS, a geographic information system program that is used commonly by engineers and geologists. If you have a laptop or other mobile device, go to this website now. The map you are looking at is the province of Alberta. Let's zoom in on the city of Calgary. The X's on the map depict all of the schools in Calgary. The different colors represent the type of school, for example, a public, separate, private, charter, and so on. The O's on the map represent the schools which MRU has partnered with. Click on one of the O's and you will be able to see the value that we obtained from our experiments, the range of values from the water treatment plant, and the differences between them when compared to our experiment. Pause the video and complete the following exercise. Thanks for being part of our water sampling project. Your help has enabled our researchers and students to learn more about water sampling using atomic absorption and ion chromatography. Now that you have participated in this project with us, the MRU chemistry teachers would like you to contribute to a study which simply consists of a survey asking for your opinions about the experience working with us. The study is called Analyzing the Effectiveness of a Community Service Learning Project in the Analytical Chemistry II Laboratory. Your science or homeroom teacher will provide each of you with three documents to participate in the study. The first is a consent form for your parents, the second is an assent form for you, and the third is the survey itself. You will need to take these forms home and have your parents look over them with you. If you would like to participate in the study, you and your parents will need to fill out the documentation and bring it back to your teacher as soon as possible. Participation in the study is completely voluntary. Thank you in advance for your contribution to this important piece of research. Thanks once again for helping us with this project. Give yourself a round of applause and stay curious. Yeah.